Are you ready, kids? Hello, it's Employee Million, and welcome back to SpongeComs. Today's episode is Season 2, Episode 18, or Episode 38 overall, Sailor Mouth and Artist Unknown, both of which originally premiered on Nick on September 21st, 2001. We're in the home stretch, guys. We're getting near the end of Season 2, and it is going to be really sad for me, personally, to leave this season behind, but I don't know. I love it so much, and I've loved talking about every episode about it so far, and let's keep this train going. Let's see if we can get to Season 3, which I'll do later in the year, but still. On to Sailor Mouth, which was written by Walt Dawn, Paul Tibbet, and Meriwether Williams, and from the very first frame, that title card, you know that this is going to be a ride. Hardly do you ever hear vocals during a title card track. And that song is Sailing Over the Dogger Bank, which I think is an old sea shanty that was repurposed by APM and then they got it onto the show. But what's fascinating about Sailing Over the Dogger Bank is that it does have a slightly like racy language in it. Like, they rhyme treesh with the S word, and it is absolutely hilarious that they got a song onto Spongebob with a swear in it. Like, they don't have the swear in the part that they use, but, again, absolutely stunning that they did that at all. I think the next thing to just talk about is the dumpster graffiti, and how it is so common in cities and stuff, and... How some of this stuff, like Squidward Smells Good and Crabs is a, is still sometimes used in the backgrounds of the new episodes, like in uh, Mall Girl Pearl. They used some of that, those phrases, for graffiti in certain places. Two bits of graffiti really fascinate me, though. One is just Onyx, O-N-I-X, which is a pun on Onyx Rocks, but... It could also just be a reference to the Pokemon Onyx, because that's how his name is spelled. And it's so weird that Spongebob referenced Pokemon. Well, maybe it did, maybe it didn't, maybe it was totally un unintentional. But it's so strange that they referenced Pokemon and both franchises are still going on to this day. That is hysterical to me. And another thing is the message Patchy was here, which is interesting to me because I don't know if they're discussing Patchy the Pirate with that or a different kind of Patchy, but if Patchy was here, then that's totally strange. Maybe this is part of the timeline where he did get to meet Spongebob in Truth or Square or the birthday blowout. But then again, they do Dolphin Chirp earlier and then that's special. I'm getting ahead of myself. But this episode was based on an event in creative director Derek Dryman's childhood. This might be a bit of a familiar story, because this is also how The Secret Box was written, just an event in one of the writer's or creative director's childhoods that they turned into an episode. These, this really goes beyond the noun game stuff and into... What's something funny from my own life that I can turn into this episode for this show that's entertaining us just as much as it's entertaining millions of kids and adults over the world? And that is, again, it is very hysterical that you did something dumb as a kid, we're going to make you Patrick or Spongebob in this episode. Like, that's just a really fun way to, like... And that is some serious maximum capacity for the Krusty Krab. 350 patrons at once? That is completely unheard of for something that's like 30 by 30 feet. I'm, I'm going to have to call BS on crabs for that one. But speaking of BS, this is the swearing episode of Spongebob, which is probably the reason it's still so well remembered and so well quoted, despite most of the profanity being censored. Funny thing is that swearing episodes in animation kind of had, like, a big boom in the late 90s and early 2000s because they did this on Arthur, they did this on the Powerpuff Girls, they almost did this on Dexter's Lab, but that episode infamously 
was left on the cutting room floor for 15 odd years. But Spongebob is easily the one that has stood the test of time the most and is easily the most popular of these. And it was not without its controversy. This episode did come under fire from the Parents Television Council, the PTC, in 2005. But the odd thing is that was four years after this episode premiered. So I don't know why they were just sitting on this and then decided that a rerun was offensive to them. But who really cares about what the PTC has to say? A lot of people, it seems, but ugh, whatever. Don't want to really get into that. And perhaps another thing about this episode that has attracted some debate and attention and discussion among fans to this day is the question of whether the actors for these characters really swore during the recording session. Uh, Tom Kenny, voice of Spongebob, who was definitely there for those, has given conflicted reports. Sometimes he'll say, we had to do fake swears. Sometimes he'll say, we had to do real swears just to get that real reaction out of it. Other times he'll say, they had to start with fake swears, but then Steve let them drop actual curse words, and that just made it a lot funnier, and that Nickelodeon still has the recordings of them cussing, but has very intelligently left it unseen to the public. Like, every once in a while, you'll get whispers of voice actors swearing, and it is really funny to see. There is the story of... You know that Simpsons episode where Homer has the swear jar? There is a story that they had kids touring the studio that day and Dan Castellaneta was really going at it. He was really swearing as Homer. And that's that's quite a story to tell the grandkids. And also, very recently, the some My Little Pony voice actor tapes have gotten leaked of them using profanities and stuff. And... It's really sad when that happens. There's unfortunately a lot of leaks these days, but again, you can't really help it. Plus it does add more to the mystique of this episode. Like it will be a total gold mine when this somehow releases, even though a lot of people wouldn't want it to. And this scene right here of SpongeBob swearing, Patrick trying to alert Mr. Krabs and swearing himself, is kind of how it happened in Paul Tibbet's real life. And he has also mentioned, sorry, no, sorry, Derek Dryman. One of the two, sorry. And he has mentioned that his mother was who they talked to and she had kind of a sailor mouth herself. Also a very clever title because, again, sailor mouth is a pun because sailors swear a lot. You can count on Mr. Krabs for that. Uh... What was I also going to say? But yeah, we have heard Tom Kenny swear in some other shows. We have heard him swear as Spongebob when he did an interview talking about how he got the voice. Sometimes he says it's from Rock. Again, very conflicted sources from the guy himself. But when he was on a talk show one time, he talked about his experiences during like a Christmas mall Santa stint well, maybe a Christmas commercial stint, and one of the elves was really going at it, just dropping all the bombs, and that was a voice that really stuck with him, so he later used it on Rocco and Spongebob, and yeah. If you want your child to grill and just look up that video, Tom Kenny Elf should be very easy to find. Don't worry, guys, he was just using sentence enhancers. I'm also very surprised that they stuck to 13 swear words for this because there is a hell of a lot more. I just used one, sorry. And they just stuck to 13. You could say like 20 or 30 or 100. I'm kind of happy that they didn't dip into slurs, but, you know, that's way too heavy for Spongebob. Profanity is already pushing it. Plus, we already have squirrel jokes for that sort of stuff. And pressure, too. 
gosh, this is one of the more edgy seasons of the show, isn't it? Looking back. But I really don't mind it. It shows that we were very different back then, and it's still pretty funny to see. So yeah, 13. Squidward making reference to, isn't there only seven? Is probably a reference to uh, Seven Dirty Words, a routine by George Carlin, I believe. A few more things I want to bring up about this episode is... One, the game Eels and Escalators. Uh, I read somewhere on SpongeBuddy Mania a long time ago, they had a feature where you look at the rules of the game and because they have it from all different angles and draw or paint those backgrounds from all different sorts of angles and didn't really have a source image of what it should look like, that when you put it all together, it makes pretty much no sense and you can't really win the game. It's impossible to play. And it does say that SpongeBob was... did deserve to say it. The bad word number 11. But, uh... Yeah. Why'd they even play Eels and Escalators in the first place? If it is rigged, I will never know. Another thing I want to say is that uh, dolphin chirp or dolphin noise is forever going to be a shorthand with Spongebob fans for, like, a cuss word. Like, I don't really swear a lot in my videos, nothing that should trigger YouTube's algorithms and all that. But on places like Spongebob Mania and the Spongebob community, I guess, haven't been there in a while, they will censor you if you say something like the F word with a dolphin noise. And even though there are a lot of other noises that they use to great comedic effect, mind you, it's still dolphin noise. That is what we think of when we think of swearing, especially on SpongeBob. And I wouldn't have it any other way. It's such an off beach way to censor someone. And it just makes it a whole lot funnier, a whole lot more nautical especially, and it just makes it stick out all the more. It is a classic episode, and it's a lot of people's favorite, and obviously it struck a chord and has stuck with people for this long for a good reason. We're already almost a minute into Artist Unknown, but I don't care. I'm talking about Sailor Mouth right now. Still one of the big highlights of the season and of the show at large, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I love it. It's not really one of my very favorites, but yeah, absolute masterwork of the show and what it stands for. Artist Unknown was written by Walt Dawn, Paul Tibbet, and Marco Hare this time as their tertiary writer. And it's not an episode that I think about a lot, but I probably should because it is also really good in its own right. Because it talks about something that you don't really hear a lot on Spongebob, and that is art and what it means to make it. Of course, something about Squidward is that he is a bit of an artiste, and he makes a lot of art, and this is a discussion on what doesn't really work about him and what doesn't work about him as an artist. And I really like taking that angle. It's like taking something from that we first saw in season one and then making a whole episode about it in season two and flipping it on its head, showing us what exactly it's about. And I love it when shows do that, just introduce something strange and then actually explain it. Like it isn't rocket science, but it is really fun to see. And this episode is really obsessed with talking about the harsh reality of art, the harsh truths, in that it is completely subjective, and that although there are rules to how to use utensils and stuff like that, there aren't really a whole lot of rules on how to make good art. It is about expression, and Spongebob throughout all of this is expressing joy in doing his art, and it really shows. Squidward is showing narcissism, and that is showing as well. Uh, the trash guy at the end is expressing 
confusion, and that shows in his art. This episode also does a good job of satirizing art school. I've heard from someone who didn't really like that it did kind of treat art school very unfairly and show how it's sucking your creativity. It doesn't really do that, but it is very difficult to get good art school teachers who will care for you and nurture you and understand what art is after so many years of teaching it. Obviously, I'm no expert on the subject. I mean, look at my darn thumbnails. However, this episode does a good job of satirizing what it needs to, showing that Squidward is not fit to be an art teacher, or at least not a very good one. Like, of course, he tells Spongebob how they should do certain things, but Spongebob already knows, and he kind of de-learns after Squidward tells him to do all this stuff. And that is very cynical, but it's also kind of showing how poorly Squidward knows the world of art and what it means to create. Like, it isn't just about... It isn't just about having a big head. It's about showing why you have a big head. If I absolutely had to be totally pretentious about it. Another thing that I think really sells absurdity in this episode, what makes it surreal enough to feel like a Spongebob episode, is that they just have Michelangelo's David throughout most of it, and what was shocking on The Simpsons 10 years ago is now completely normal to see on Spongebob right here, 2001. And, again, very fun to see because they do bring up that it is a human and humans are kind of weird to see in Spongebob, but also, well, they don't bring it up at all, but they do bring up that the original David did have something called a willy, I don't know, and this art guy does bring up that it is censored by a clam, and that is just really funny. Of course, that's a bit later on. Uh, here we've got Squidward's art pieces, and yeah, it's what I'm talking about right here. Um, that one, Bold and Brash, which belongs in the trash, is easily the most famous of them all. Like, I don't really see a lot about that little 3D art with the springs. However, it is another great example of it. I think people do really like the pun of Bold and Brash. And, um, yeah, there is an original design of Bold and Brash that was rejected. They made it look a little less surreal and more akin to Squidward's body type, which I think makes it a lot funnier. Like, from here on out, they do a lot more with Squidward painting himself and trying to make himself look awesome and attractive, and they do it a lot more later on in episodes like Out of the Picture and especially in Squid's Visit, where they make a joke that Spongebob is still better at Squidward, better than Squidward at art. I also really like this change of heart for Squidward, that now he has two... Okay, that's really funny, just <laughs> the single tear. Now he actually has to care for Spongebob and care about his art. He actually has to be a good teacher, how about that? And that is where he fails. It's where he eventually throws a hissy fit and destroys all his art. And another thing that's really good about this episode and how they integrate it into SpongeBob and Squidward's dynamic is that they make SpongeBob a total kid here, just doing arts and crafts, and Squidward is more adult. He's more about sophistication and more about, you know the more refined aspect of art culture. I mean, there is an art circle for arts and crafts and 
how you can make modern art out of that. But, yeah, the way they do it here with Spongebob and Squidward is really clever. As is Spongebob kind of losing his touch and sort of second-guessing himself as an artist, which a lot of artists do IRL, and this is really no exception. Some people do lose their mojo, whether it's through time or through, like, a peak or a valley in their output. Also, here, yeah, they do the same really routine that they did in Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy 3. It's a little different. SpongeBob doesn't say really as much, but yeah. I also like that janitors and trash are a common theme in this episode. Like you see the janitor at the start and then you see him putting Squidward in the trash and then it goes back to the trash. It's just a very well-constructed story and I really like where they go with it. I'm sorry that we're at the tail end of season two and we've still got episodes that don't really have a whole lot of stuff that you can talk about. I guess one thing I don't really like in this episode is the big Australian action uh, art guy. It's another one of my... <laughs> It's just that D. Bradley Baker voice again, and it does get a bit annoying after a while. It's the same as the shark and the smoking peanut, and the king and sleepy time, and yeah. Not one of my favorites. I think the joke that people do remember the absolute most from this episode is this bit right here, with Spongebob embracing the marble and doing everything he can with it. And it really builds up to this massive moment of SpongeBob creating rubbish, just nothing but rubble. I mean, it's all about the performance. It's all about its placement in the episode. It's all about the music, the staging. I mean, it's just a great cartoon moment. And I think it should be considered like a top 10 SpongeBob moment, honestly. Especially with how he has to put a Squidward nose on it in hopes that Squidward would like it. And telling Squidward to soak it in. Oh my gosh, it's up there with some of the best comedy of all time, honestly. And of course, Squidward's creative breakdown at the end. And Spongebob's misinterpretation of it is him getting excited by his art. And of course, the very end of that, where Squidward ends up making an even better David and blaming the janitor for it. I mean, it's all just great comedy. You don't really need to explain it to more in depth. There's a bit more like mixed media at the end with that dust cloud, not really being a cartoon cloud, more like a, just a puff that they made. And then the, Better David being live action, which, again, just really sells the absurdity of it. And that was Sailor Mouth and Artist Unknown. My question of the week for you last week was, what's your favourite family member on Spongebob? I had a lot of pretty good answers. Jack McGinn went with Plankton's extended family. Rebel Friend went with uh, Old West Ancestors from Pest of the West. Super Seal went with Plankton's family as well. Oh, thank you. And Dashiell Rose... I hope I pronounced that right. Said Spongebob parents are the best family members in my opinion. We hardly get to see them at all in the entire show. I wholeheartedly agree. Like, they're already minor characters in the first five seasons, but they almost completely vanish from the show after that. And that's kind of sad because there are stories that you can tell with them, especially these days. But I guess you've got to make Spongebob more independent, so the message of the show that you can still feel like a kid as an adult can stick with you a bit more. But I digress. Question of the week now is, would you buy an art piece from Squidward? Like, even unironically. I know a lot of you have the urge to hang up bold and brash in your living room, but would you actually pay a hefty fee for it? Would you 
actually want it to be as authentic as possible, buy it from Nickelodeon or something. Really want to know that. I've got a lot of tension next week in Jellyfish Hunter and the Fryco Games. I'll see you then. Goodbye for now.